your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17. Such a powerful text on righteousness, yet not common. Some of you might be seeing it for the first time, but it's so resounding. Are you in Isaiah 32, verse 17? Read it together loud as you can. One, two, go. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Read it again, one, two, go. Now, this is a prophecy about the true religion of the spiritual Israel, the church of Jesus Christ. First, we are told that this will be a company of righteous people. But it doesn't stop there. It says the righteousness that they will have will have an effect. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, are you with me? He said the righteousness that they will have will have an effect. And what is that effect? It says that righteousness will beget peace. And that righteousness will birth quietness. And that righteousness will birth what? Assurance forever. That's the word of the Lord. You see, the doctrine of righteousness that many teach today, I say respectfully, is not biblical at all. Instead of birthing peace, it births fretfulness. And instead of being eternal, it is conditional. But the word of God sets the record straight. It says righteousness, true righteousness, actual biblical righteousness, salvific righteousness will have an effect. And what would the, re re the effect be? Peace and quietness and what? Assurance forevermore. And what does this mean? It means that when you receive the gift of righteousness in Christ Jesus, you will rest assured knowing that you are his forever. That is the doctrine of righteousness. So once upon a time, you would wake up and discover that because you were sleeping, your relatives and loved ones did not want to wake you up when they were going out. So they went out without waking you up. And when you woke up, to discover that you were the only one at home, you were home alone. Because of all the movies you had seen about the second coming of Christ, you became very scared. And you were saying, no, 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 no. It's not, you know, <laughs> some of you are laughing because you know it has happened to you before. <laughs> and you went from room to room. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh. And then you're remembering, what could have caused it? What made me miss it? You know? <laughs> But that's not the true effect of righteousness. Let me tell you something. When I'm done with this teaching, the next time something like that happens, you know how you react? You say, the rapture couldn't have happened because I'm here. I'm here. It couldn't have happened yet because I'm still here. I don't have to check for anyone else. If I'm here, it has not happened. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, some of you, who are not accustomed to teachings like this will be like, what, what are you saying? What are you trying to prove? Hey, slow down. And just go on this journey, this adventure. Let me tell you something. When you hear something that you're not used to, your reflex to study on it should be stronger than your reflex to argue on it. So let's just go on a journey in the word of God and see what the Bible says. I mean, I just read a text to you. The effect of righteousness, the Bible says, will be righteousness. It will be peace, I beg your pardon, and quietness, and what? What is the duration of the assurance? Forever. Another text you should read, 1 John, chapter 5, verse 13. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 13. You need to open that as fast as possible. Are you there already? He says, these things have I written unto you, you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know 
that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Everybody, First John chapter 5, verse 13, read together, loud as you can, want to go. It says, these things have I written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God. Let me ask you, do you believe on the name of the Son of God? Do you have eternal life? Do you know that you have eternal life? Yeah, he said, I want you to know. God wants you to know and be sure. Let me tell you something. There is no salvation without assurance. Any doctrine of salvation, void of assurance, it's not Bible salvation. If you have eternal life, God believes that you ought to know. And he wants you to know and to be sure about it. You see, according to God's soteriological design, he has designed that you receive eternal life first before you step into eternity. That means no one will enter heaven surprised. Because those who will enter heaven first have heaven enter them. That's God's design. And because heaven enters you first, you know, you know you're going to enter heaven. That's God's design. I have written this to you so that you will know that you have eternal life. Say that with me. Say, I know that I have eternal life. I want to do with, I mean, a brief expose of some part of church history. And that's one part of theology that many people in our generation do not know. I want to talk about a man who is very crucial to church history. He goes by the name Martin Luther. Many people only know Martin Luther King Jr. And that's a great man. But this Martin Luther is also very important. You see, Martin Luther did not know much about assurance of salvation like many people in his day. Not just him, there was a widespread ignorance about assurance of salvation or any other thing about God. And because the Bible was only written in Latin, which in that time only the priest could read. Do you know how blessed you are to have a Bible you can read? So this man, though he loved God, was so fearful, so religious, one day, a storm, there was a storm, and lightning almost struck him. And like many of you do, you know, when there is trouble, you know, you just quickly make a vow because you think you have to tie God with that before God remembers to do his job. And so he made a quick vow, not to God, but to Saint Anne. <laughs> Save me, Saint Anne, he said. If you do, I'll be a monk. And so miraculously, he survived that encounter. And two days after, he dropped out of law school and went to monastery. But you see, even in monastery, he couldn't get over his obsession of his sinfulness. And so he would go to the priest every now and then and confess his sins incessantly. He, he became very popular for that. Oh, I want to confess this. Oh, I want to confess that. Oh, I want to confess always confessing and then one day he was studying his bible and just stumbled on the simple texts the just shall live by faith <laughs> it was like another lightning struck him this time a spiritual one the just shall live by faith meaning salvation it's not by good deeds, as great as good deeds are. And you don't get saved by praying or by fasting or by religious obligation or by sacraments or by anything. You just believe. Oh my God. I mean, he couldn't contain himself. He felt so liberated. But not only did he feel liberated, he began to feel a growing resentment for error. There was so much error in that day. Do you realize people paid money for forgiveness of sins? 
there was something called indulgence. Indulgence was bought. So when you sin, if you have money and it was only for people who could afford it, you were going to pay money and then you will receive a certificate and that certificate was supposed to reduce your time in purgatory. I'm talking history now. So not only was he liberated by this truth, he was angered by the error. He wanted all men to know the truth about assurance of salvation. And one day he had had enough. And he wrote 95 theses against buying indulgence and went in a dramatic fashion, nailed it to the door of the chapel so that everyone entering could read it. And even though we don't have all the time to read 95 pieces to you, there is a summary of what that this is and the entire reformation stands for. And I'll read it to you, it goes thus. That justification before God is by grace alone, say grace alone. Grace alone. On the basis of Christ alone, say Christ alone. Christ alone. Through faith alone, say faith alone. As taught finally and decisively in the scriptures alone, say scriptures alone. For the ultimate glory of God alone, say God alone. God alone. But what I said was actually written originally in Latin. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Gratia is spelled G-R-A-T-I-A. Soli Christo, through Christ alone. Sola fide, through the means of faith alone. Sola Scriptura, as taught in the scriptures alone. Soli Deo Gloria. glory of God alone. And so when we call the camp meeting Solid Day of Gloria, we are saying primarily that the truth of salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. Time is past, friends. This is the abridged version of what I originally planned to teach. So I just want to go straight to this and, and answer the question, what did Jesus do to assure you of salvation. What did Jesus do to assure you of salvation? I'm not talking about the provision of salvation, but I'm talking in particular about the assurance of salvation. What has he done about it? First and foremost, in his earthly ministry, Jesus prayed about it. He prayed about it in John chapter 17, verse 11. John 17, 11. Jesus said, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to you. He says, Holy Father, keep through your name those you have given to me. Keep them. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you believe his prayer was answered? Yes, sir. He says, keep them. And someone says, oh, yeah, he was praying for his disciples. He said in verse 20, I'm not praying for these alone, but for everyone who will believe on your name. Everyone who will believe after this. He said, keep them. So this was part of the package, you see. This is not a message that some grace enthusiasts came up with 2,000 years after. This was the desire of the Christ, his prayer. He prayed that you will be kept in salvation and in the unity of the faith. Not only did he pray about it, he preached about it. Let me tell you this. Jesus unequivocally declared that salvation will come with assurance. And there is, there's just a plethora of scriptures that can run through. But for time's sake, Let's go through just one. There are other things we'll study. Look at John chapter 6, verse 38 and verse 39. Oh, this is resounding, I tell you. <laughs> John chapter 6, verse 38. 
Now, I want you to read verse 38 loud as you can. One, two, go. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sends me. And what is his will? And what does he say in verse 39? Verse 39, one, two, go. And this is the Father's will which he has sent me, that of all which he had given to me, I should lose one. He said, I should lose nothing. But should raise it up again at the last day. Listen, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. He means, he's saying when you take stock of people who first believed and people who received the consummation of salvation at the end, he says not a single wall will be lost. Listen, he says this is the will of the Father. This is the plan. This is the salvific design. He says that of all the Father has given to me, I should lose nothing. Nothing. This is why I'm telling you, you don't wake up and find an empty house and think, oh, he's left you. Eh? He said he will lose nothing. Hey, I will not be left behind. It's not. Hallelujah. What did Jesus do about your assurance? He prayed about it. He preached about it. And he swore about it. He did what? You see, even in normal human interaction, if you want to get assurance from some people, some people have the habit of swearing. How do I know you fulfill your promise? I promise I will. And some of them might say, swear to me. Say, I didn't know. I mean, it's something we're used to. And in those days, people were used to swearing by something greater. The Jews would swear by the temple or swear by the high priest or swear by God. And listen, God doesn't need to swear to you. Listen, his word is here and amen. So he only does this just to help the weak faith of some people to make you doubly sure. The Bible says that by two immutable things it is impossible for God to lie. All right? So, on one hand, the word of God is here and amen, and then he swears. And the Bible says, because he couldn't, there is nothing greater. Men swear by something greater. He looks and there's nothing greater. The Bible says he swore by himself. Come on, are you with me? Men seek to swear by something higher, but there's nothing higher than God. And so he swears by himself. I want us to read this as fast as we can. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13. 13. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13. Then we'll read verse 16 into verse 18. I wish we could take our time and just harvest all these texts one after the other. But I know you're getting it, aren't you? So look at verse 13. It says, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. <laughs> Verse 16. For men verily swear by greater, and an oath of confirmation to them, an end of all strife. So when someone says, I swear, you say, okay, you are settled somehow in your heart. So he's explaining that what God has done should help you settle with the idea of assurance of salvation. You should settle finally. Verse 17. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of, the, of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by, by an oath. So he didn't have to, but he just went overboard to show the heirs of salvation. Just to show you, to assure you. So listen, why are you afraid? Jesus prayed about it. Jesus preached about it. God swore about it. Why are you afraid? His word is enough. But now he has sworn about it. He says, by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Say strong consolation. 
Leave KG, KJV. KJV. Say strong assurance. strong assurance. Meaning he doesn't just want you to have assurance, he wants it to be strong. <laughs> The kind of assurance that they can't talk you out of. The reason why your assurance needs to be strong is because after you've heard this sermon, you will likely hear another sermon that says, Don't mind those people! But listen, my assurance is strong. <laughs> you know they shake. <laughs> Hallelujah! Is your assurance strong? And it's strong with good reason. God swore. What, what else do you want? Come on. What else do you want? There is nothing greater to swear about. And so he swears by himself. And he says, look at how immutable. Listen, God's word does not fall to the ground. And then he swears on top of that. I mean, if after this you still doubt. There has to be another, we have to replace Doubting Thomas and put your name. There's a new title. Glory be to God. Notch the person by your side, say, is your assurance strong? Is this strong enough? <laughs> Where did we stop? Look at verse 19. I just want us to take time. Verse 19. He says, for which, and he says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. You know what an anchor is? Something that keeps the boat, you know, at the bottom. It keeps the boat from sailing and wandering. He says, what God has done is an anchor for your soul. This, this is God's view of salvation. This is how God wants you to view salvation. He wants you anchored. He doesn't want you wavering. He doesn't just want you surfing on the ocean, wandering. If you will make it or if you will, he wants to anchor you. Say assurance. Which hope we have as an anchor for our souls. Both sure and steadfast. <laughs> and which enters into within the veil. It says sure and steadfast. Thank you, Jesus. It says, we that the foreigner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, I wish I could preach on this some more. What has God done about your assurance? Number one, Jesus prayed about it. Jesus preached about it. God swore about it. And that's not all. He gave you a seal for it. He gave you a seal. He gave you a seal. Listen. Do you know how ignorant you have to be not to be sure that you're saved? I mean, just, just look at this. Look at all that we are going through. How ignorant you have to be? There is no salvation without assurance. None. It's not a biblical concept. Those who are saved ought to know without a doubt. Is there anybody like that in the hall today? Anybody who is saved and knows? Hallelujah. Popular text in this church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Ha, 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 ha. Thank you, Thank Jesus. You, Jesus. <laughs> Read with me one to go. In whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Listen, the word translated seal is Arabon. Arabon was the same word, a derivative of that word was used for engagement rings. Hallelujah. Listen, God has put something on your hand to make sure everybody who cares to know knows that you're seeing someone. Hallelujah. 
Tell the person by your side and say, I'm seeing someone. I'm seeing someone. Even if the person is your husband. <laughs> I'm seeing someone. Hallelujah. 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 Just, just imagine. Listen. I know women in particular. Hey, I will get in trouble for this, but. But it's funny, so I'll say. I think women in particular struggle with assurance generally, especially when it comes to anything long. Yes or yes? Anyway, subjective. <laughs> but I know that you can take a woman on a trip around the world, you know, buy her shoes, clothes, you know, and at the end of the day, she'll look at you in the eye, sigh, and say, do you love me? <laughs> you know, one day Eve asked Adam, do you love me? Adam said, who else? Who else? Yes, there's, there's, there's literally no one else. It's just, it's just you, it's just us. No competition. But now, but now, if a guy is giving you attention, and you're not really sure how serious he is with, about his commitment, but then he's consistent with that, but you say, well, this is not my first relationship. Men can misbehave and all of that. I'll keep watching. And then he says, I, I want to get to meet your family members. And he meets your family members. He misses your parents, you know. And all of that. And you're like, hmm, well, well, let's still see how it goes. And then one day, he gives you an engagement ring. Listen. Listen. Some of you say, some of you will say, well, some people still, you know what I'm saying? Let me tell you what I'm doing. Let me tell you what I'm doing. Jesus did it a lot. He said, if you then being evil know to give good gifts to your children, how much more? So even if human examples don't come close, if there are still men who will give an engagement ring and keep their word, then if you help, you see how much more? Let me tell you something. Do you know how hypocritical it is for a married man not to believe in assurance of salvation. <laughs> I did preach, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> you know? You don't believe in assurance, but you believe that two frail human beings can stand face to face and exchange vows. And the other person will leave that place trusting that he or she meant what he said. How dare you? So how much more God? Listen. He said, after that you believed, listen, listen, listen. After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Listen, you know the Bible categorically says that you were not saved with corruptible things such as silver or gold. You know you engage people with silver or gold. But listen, the item of the engagement is something priceless. He gave you his very spirits to live and dwell in you. He gave you his very spirits. Do you know what that means? That you, listen, 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 listen. Salvation is not a probation. If it was probation, if you were on probation, he won't give you his spirit. He expects you to know that his spirit, listen, his spirit is not just so that you can speak in tongues as great as that is. That spirit in you is assurance. Assurance. So that you will not doubt. He says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the end nest of our inheritance until the redemption of our purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That's what the Holy Spirit is. Assurance. He gave you the Holy Spirit to clear your doubts. What else can he give you? What else? 
What else? What else? You know, some people say, ah, if we preach this, people will begin to misbehave. They will begin to live light and do silly things. But there is something greater at stake. If we preach salvation without assurance, salvation by works, we are tampering with something more dangerous. We are tampering with the glory of God. Let's, listen, Paul explained this this way. He said if it was by works, we have occasion for boosting. Do you know how serious that is? If you work in your company and at the end of the day they pay you salary, you may or may not say thank you. It's your right. You work for it. So you see, if salvation is by works, it is no more by grace. And if it is no more by grace, then it is no more to the glory of God. There is something dangerous at stake. Let me tell you something. The reason why many people think that there are many ways to God is because many people have misrepresented salvation. If you feel that salvation is by works, it's not different from any other religion. Because in every other religion, everybody is just trying to do better. So, oh, you are trying to do better in this religion, you are trying to do better in this religion, then it must be the same God. But salvation, no matter how good you are, you can never be good enough. Let me tell you something. Oh my God, I wish I had enough time to preach on this. <laughs> Do you realize the first time the word born again was mentioned? The first time someone was told you must be born again, that message was not preached to a prostitute or to a robber or to any other notorious person that you may think of, any obviously morally bankrupt person you may, may think of. It was preached to Nicodemus. Someone who was the moral standard in his society, a teacher of the Jews. And then he comes to Jesus by night. You have to understand how special this meeting is. Jesus didn't go through their Levitical system. He didn't go through all their scholarly procedures, you know. And someone who is a teacher of the Jews comes to Jesus, son of a carpenter, and calls him rabbi. And that was so powerful. Listen, I wish I had more time to preach on this. You call him rabbi? Meaning I defer to you, I respect you. And he says, no one can do these great miracles except God be with him. Let me tell you something. Do you know how special that is for any charismatic preacher? That someone who is a notable person in the society will come to you and say that, that your charismatic ministry be begins to attract men of repute. Nicodemus wasn't just a religious leader. He doubled as someone who was influential, an interface between the Roman government and the Jews. A man of means, a wealthy man. And he comes to you and he's paying you that compliment and Jesus almost literally didn't let him finish. He says, very, very, I say unto you, most assuredly I say unto you, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Not even enter, you won't even see it. You won't smell it, you can't touch it. If God says that to Nicodemus, it is proof that the best of us will never be good enough. And so the standard of salvation is sure. No matter how good you are, you can't enter without Christ. And when you enter, you're not coming out. You're not coming out. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> We have this hope as an anchor for our souls. He has tied you there. <laughs> Some of you are saying, Pastor, do you know what I've been doing? Well, you are here. God dragged you here. <laughs> Let me tell you, you can't run away if you tried. He says you have this hope as an anchor. He has tied you. His graces will preserve you. The, pro the, the problem is you have... Seeing this from the standpoint of your own efforts, I want you to see it from the standpoint of the power of God and what he's capable of doing. Look at what Paul had to say to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Oh God. Oh dear Lord. 
Please, are you learning anything? I hope you are getting this. I hope you are getting this. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. I want you to read this loud as you can. One, two, go. When it says being confident, is that assurance or not? It, 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 look how Paul is sure me. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's sure for me. Ask the person, it's sure for you. He said, being confident of this one thing. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. Listen, we're not here trying to encourage sin. Many people like Martin Luther are actually trying to please God. Trying to please God. They want to serve God and they want to love Him and they want to serve Him. But somehow, they just realize they'll never be good enough and they're confessing incessantly. Listen, he says, you have an assurance for those who believe in Jesus. Being confident of this very thing. This changed my life as an undergraduate. He who has begun a good work in me shall perform it until the day of Jesus. Listen, I know that I might have some things that I'm trying to do better at, but guess what? His power in me is greater. His power will defeat those habits. Defeat all those inconsistencies. Being confident of this very thing. He that has started with you will finish. Let me tell you something. There are no uncompleted projects in true salvation. God finishes what he started. What he has started with you, he is faithful to complete. Say loud amen if you believe. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. There is a reason he's called author and finisher. <laughs> Glory to God. Say with me, say, being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work will perfect it, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, he means Jesus Christ is going to come and find you still basking and bouncing in his word, in the truth. No backsliding for you. <laughs> when you try to backslide, it will push you forward. Grace will push you forward. Did you hear what I said? I know the power of Jesus. The power that can confront Saul on his way to Damascus, knock him off his horse. Do you know the power we're talking about here? I'm talking about Jesus. You're talking about habits. I'm talking about Jesus. He will knock you off the horse of rebellion. Take away the appetite for all those wrong things. Being confident of this very thing. We got a testimony today, Pastor Tish shared with me. Someone in the Abuja church who was so addicted to masturbation every night, he won't sleep without doing it. And he said he's shocked since the boot camp ended in Abuja. So he said, he said, he, he, he has been screaming. He can't believe it. Being confident of this very thing. <laughs> he who has begun a good work in you will perform it. Don't let the devil cheat you. Oh. Don't let the devil cheat you. Don't let the devil sell a message to you that you have sinned too much and God can't accept you. Listen, prodigal son, you will come back to find that your father had been waiting. And you didn't have to stray that long being confident. I'll give you one more. Look at Jude verse 24. Jude verse 24. Thank you, Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you're here and you're hearing this message for the first time, you, you realize some people run away from church because they're honest. They feel that church and Christianity is about trying not to do bad. And they just look at themselves and say, well, I can't, that's not me, I can't, there's no need deceiving myself. But I'm here to explain to you, the just shall live by faith. It's not about your efforts. 
is about Christ's work once and for all. And listen, if you will believe today and be born again tonight, I'm confident of this one thing. He that will begin a good work in you tonight will perform it until the day of Jesus. Your love is deeper. Your grace is wider. Your name is covering all. I stand a new man. Empowered. Catalabo I am living, I am standing for. Lift your hands and both say, Your love is deeper. Your love is deeper. And your grace is wider. Your grace is wider. And your name. Your name. I am living, I am standing for you. Sing it and pause, say, your love is deeper. Your love is deeper. Your grace is wider. Your name is higher. Declaration of assurance. Are you ready to sing this with me? Say, where you are, you brought me to. Katoria Mahaya, forever. Again. 
rise again. God brought you to this camp meeting to help you rise, to help you stand. He said, you know what he says? He says, laying aside every weight and the sin that easily besets. He says, run with patience. Run. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Are you in Jude? Jude verse 24. I want you to read it loud as you can. One, two, go. Say it one more time from your spirit now unto him that is able to keep me from falling and to present me faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. With exceeding joy! With exceeding joy! that repents. I want us to give heaven something to shout about. Maybe all these years you thought it was by works but you just heard the gospel for the first time that if you shall believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead you shall be saved. If you believe like you believe tonight. So I want you to come forward. Any such person. We're going to wait for you. If you're coming from the gallery, we will wait for you, wherever you are. It is because of you that we came. Where you are, yeah. Where you are, yeah. There's something to shout about. Where you are, yeah. Where you are. Where you are. Where you are, yeah. Where you are, yeah. I see someone. I see someone. Cigarettes are in your pocket. Cigarettes are in your pocket. It doesn't matter what you've done. Come, come. Where you are, I belong. What, what is that? What are you bringing out? All right, I just wanted to be sure. Hallelujah. Listen, I want to say this. You know, in, in some meetings, 
Just to feel successful with an altar call, they unsettle you. They unsettle your assurance so that more people will come out. It doesn't really matter. Even if it is one person, it's enough to throw a party in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's enough to throw a party in heaven. Sir, God loves you. He died for you. And he's going to walk with you in such a powerful way. From today, your life is going to change. And this is what is going to happen. God is going to begin to speak to you. You're going to enter into an active relationship with the Holy Spirit. He will guide you and lead you. Please close your eyes, sir. Say with me, Lord Jesus. I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that you are the Christ. You died for me. You died for my sins. So my sins are forgiven. I receive your Holy Spirit. Assurance of salvation. I know that when you come for your church, I will meet with you in the clouds. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Congratulations. You can shout some more. Hallelujah. So, sir, I want you to go over the protocol. We're just going to lead you and guide you. Please appreciate it. Listen. In case you were too shy to come out, but this was a defining moment for you. You understood the gospel for the first time. Maybe you even made that confession in your seat. I want you to join them. The reason is this. We want to follow up with you and help you stand and grow you. You understand? So that's very important. So take note of that. Hallelujah. Well, we're about to close now. But I want you to know, sit down for a minute. Listen, this is an, an entire camp meeting. All the sermons from now till Sunday are one. Did you hear what I said? It's one sermon. And I don't want you to miss anything. Every part of this camp meeting is crafted intentionally. What time does tomorrow morning session start? What time will you be here? Hallelujah. Make sure by the time we're saying praise the Lord by 6 a.m. you're here. Hallelujah. I said it's a baptism. Let's immerse you very well. Be a sponge. Soak this thing well. Let your profiting appear. Let there be more evidence that you came here than selfies. Hallelujah. I'm serious. Something, 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 something. Something radical must happen to you. Are you aware there will be many miracles in this camp meeting? Thank you, Jesus.